Good afternoon to all. I am really grateful to Dr. Ranjit and uh, Dr. Ankit Srivastava for giving me this opportunity to speak on this wonderful platform. <clears throat> um, my topic is uh, directly not linked to the forensic investigation, but my subject has a great implication in forensic uh, sciences. Basically, I'm a molecular biologist and we are working on ancient DNA, which, uh, uh, which has great implication in forensic science. So most of the time, our samples are uh, archeological remains. Uh, these kind of samples are everywhere in the country. Most of them are in museums, in archeological collections. Uh, Sometimes we also get uh, degraded and very tough samples, uh, which has forensic implication from different, different forensic uh, organizations. But this is not my routine job. So I'll be talking about the power of ancient DNA and uh, how we can use this technology in forensic investigation. So what is ancient DNA and why uh, we are interested in ancient DNA? So in ancient DNA is isolated from any archeological, paleontological remains, museum specimens and human remains of forensic in interest. Um, sample consists of uh, bone, hair samples, skin samples, like any biological samples which are uh, degraded but not uh, completely mineralized in the form of fossils. In country like uh, India, um, we can extract DNA not from very old specimen, but up to some extent, up to some uh, time period, we can easily extract DNA, which we call ancient DNA. Then we compare this ancient DNA with the modern uh, database to interpret the results. The sources of ancient DNA could be uh, bone specimen, uh, hair samples, scat samples, human poo, and uh, sometimes sediment samples. So I'll be talking about uh, uh, all these sources in a uh, in few next slides. And uh, I'll also uh, present a few case studies which we have performed over the last couple of years. So uh, the but before that, I'll be speaking on the strength and the power of ancient DNA and uh, the few uh, breakthrough studies which have uh, changed the um, which has changed the population-based uh, knowledge of uh, entire world. A uh, few of them are like, uh, for example, Denisovan ancestry. So as we all know that uh, Homo sapiens have evolved in Africa and they have moved a uh, different part of world. And this migration started about one lakh years ago. Uh, but what happened to, uh, what happened when humans started moving all over the world, uh, whether they have mixed with any other hominid species or they were alone. So that knowledge we don't know. And we, we are also not having any fossil records. Uh, some of the specimens which were found uh, from uh, cave sites of uh, Croatia and uh, Netherlands and Spain, um, those individuals were very much looking like modern human, but whether they are modern human or not, with, with the help of ancient DNA, uh, scientists have uh, able to extract the DNA and they, they were successful to compare the data set with modern human. And then they have found that uh, once upon a time, uh, the earth was not occupied by human only, but there were many other hominid species with whom modern human have mixed a lot. So, um, all the modern European population um, and up to some extent South Asian also, they have Neanderthal ancestry and that ancestry goes up to 10 to up to 10%. It means all the modern human of Europe, they have somehow Neanderthal ancestry. It means they have mixed with the Neanderthal hominids about 40 to 45,000 years before present. So this is a wonderful uh, uh, knowledge which we have gained. Um, after analyzing the ancient DNA data from these fossil remains. Another study uh, you must have heard in 2014-15, one human-like uh, specimen were excavated from a cave that we call Denisova Cave in Altai mountain of Russia. 
um and these human like specimen have yielded uh, enough ancient dna data and then when that data was compared with the modern human um like uh, the scientists were shocked to know that uh these remains are not from modern human but other hominid species sister hominid species of modern human that they have given a term denisova human so there are many uh, many many more studies uh, have been conducted uh, in the field of ancient dna uh, uh, but here i will be talking about few case studies which we have done uh, in our laboratory um with the advent of modern technology and the power of ancient dna if the specimen are not found from a sediment layer where a human or a uh, other species have resided from that sediment layer uh, biological specimens can be retrieved and that can be sequenced and uh, after mapping with the modern human database one can know uh, uh, one can know the presence of uh, humans and uh, uh, how long and how many years how many thousand years um, a population or a group of people might have stayed in that strata of the layer so this is the advancement of uh, ancient dna uh, unlikely and surprisingly india is far behind uh, with these cutting edge technologies uh, but we are trying to uh, push and we are trying to establish all such kind of uh, methods which has also a, a huge implication in forensic sciences so this is a south asian scenario uh, we don't have much ancient dna um, we have only two labs one is cmb hyderabad from where uh, i did my phd and uh, uh, another lab which i have created in bilbal sani institute of palaeo sciences uh, three years back um but it, working on ancient dna is not uh, very easy because, you know in south asia the climatic condition is not very good we have uh, three seasons winter uh, monsoon and then hot summer um the survival of dna in a specimen is very uh, uh, very tricky um if the samples are coming from a warm environment the chances of survival of dna is is very marginal but at the same time if samples are coming from uh, high altitude regions the preservation increases several folds and uh, there are chances that we will get we get a lot of dna uh, for the downstream studies um i'll give few examples um and the challenges which we have faced over last uh, few years and uh, and the great implication of ancient dna in south asia so uh in first study uh, i'll be talking about one specimen uh which was female and uh, this specimen was found um uh, in a excavation um process which is a routine uh, process uh, of archaeologist you you all uh, must be aware that uh, india had a uh, wonderful wonderful prehistory we had a uh, huge past civilization and uh, that we call indus valley civilization the indus valley civilization um cover all the region of gujarat uh, haryana punjab and uh, pakistan so there is a site we call uh, you know rakhi gadi this site is in haryana state uh, with uh, with the ongoing excavations several human remains were found the dates of all these human remains were uh, were going back to 4300 to 4700 and 4700 years before present it means all the human remains uh, were from uh, mature harappan time scale and they all were about 4500 year old skeletons so and they all were buried morphologically they were very intact but once you will touch the bone they are very delicate and uh, extracting dna is uh, was a very tough uh, process we have tried uh, about 10 to 12 human remains and we have tried to extract and maximize the data 
uh, we have not been successful with most of the samples, but surprisingly, one sample has yielded a very marginal um, DNA. So the, uh, once you have DNA extract from such uh, PCS and such old samples and such a degraded samples, uh, you have one limitation, and that limitation is the quantity of DNA as well as the quality of DNA. Quantity, you can't quantify it because the concentration falls between 0 0.01 to maybe 10 picogram per microliter. That you can't quantify uh, on routine-based uh, uh, quantification methods. So in such kind of DNA, you can't go, you can't uh, use PCR as a method to sequence the DNA. Because if you want to sequence the complete mitochondrial DNA or some part of autosomal DNA, you have to set several hundred PCR reactions. And the DNA concentration is not enough to even go for a single PCR reaction. Then we use next generation sequencing methods. So without quantifying the DNA extract, we prepare the next generation sequencing libraries and we go for the sequencing. Once data come, we, we try to map that data with the global human databases. Maximum match goes 0.01% to 1%, sometimes 2%. And remaining 98% reads of the next generation sequencing libraries map with the bacterial DNA, fungal DNA, you can call environmental DNA. So from that 1% of map reads, we, uh, we try to see how much percentage of DNA is indigenous and how much percentage of DNA is coming from the contamination. In this sample, we have extracted 96 uh, DNA from one individual and we have prepared the libraries and we have then merged all the data to enhance our um output so this is the so this is a female individual uh, uh, died about 4500 years before present you can see the potteries and other cultural assemblage that shows that these this lady must have lived during mature harappan time period from this individual i have my team have extracted successful DNA, which is oldest DNA ever from South Asia. Then I said, uh, we prepare library and then we have uh, sequenced about 96 libraries. We have merged all the data together. We have found about 30,000 SNPs, we call single nucleate nucleotide polymorphism that we use to study the ancestry. Because you know that if you are sequencing mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosomal DNA, you will only come to know about the maternal origin. You won't, uh, you, you, you can't see uh, the admixture and uh, uh, other real ancestry coming from. So when we compared uh, the data of uh, this individual with a global data set, which also include the ancient DNA data set from different, different part of Europe, Middle East, um, and then we have concluded that this individual has local origin and this individual has a lot of ancestry that was coming from the local tribal population of India. At the same time, we have also found that at the same time, we have also found that the Iranian agriculturalist and the Indian agriculturalist, they were separated about 10 to 12,000 years before present. And this individual was not having any Central Asian affinity, then, then we have discarded any kind of RN invasion or RN migration theory on the basis of genetic data. So uh, this, the data of this individual has a lot of hope to analyze other samples all over the country, and then we are working on it. Now we are trying to extract DNA from 10,000 year old Mesolithic samples from different, different sites of Ganga Plain, um, and hoping to be successful 
in maybe in few years from now. So this is the key finding of uh, uh, this individual I have already explained. Now I'll be talking about uh, another fantastic study on a North Indian Himalayan population. So uh, this is the case of forensic anthropology. Uh, there's a lake at 5,500 meter altitude in Himalaya that we call Rupun Lake. Uh, several hundred human bodies were reported and found by a British ranger in 1948. 1947, 1948, uh, the first discovery, discovery of uh, this uh, lake was taken place. Uh, from that time until last year, uh, no one knew, no one knows that who are these individuals and what they were doing at such high altitude region of Himalaya. Uh, we started working on these human skeletons uh, in 2015-16 and we have been successful to extract DNA from all the individuals because uh, the preservation of this lake was wonderful. Uh, most of the time this lake was frozen. From such kind of individuals, one can easily extract DNA and can be, and that DNA can be used for autosomal um, DNA sequencing, mitochondrial DNA sequencing, as well as uh, for STR profiling. We did STR profiling and we found that all the most of the individuals uh, were male. Seventy percent individuals were male, uh, and thirty percent were female. But from STR, you uh, can't predict or uh, you can't reconstruct the origin, their ancestry, their migration history. Then we have uh, sequenced the whole genome and then we have analyzed the global data sets. The results uh, have surprised, has, has uh, surprised us uh, because you can clearly, you can see there are two uh, ancestral group uh, out of these uh, 24 samples. One group is showing affinity with the Greek population of Europe. Another group is showing significant affinity with the South Asian ancestry, mostly uh, North Indian. Uh, so uh, this was a fantastic study because from the genetic data confirmed that at, they were two groups. So far uh, on the morphological studies also, it was concluded that they were likely two groups, where one group were very tall, another group were short or medium height, another group were very robust, uh, while at the same time other group were uh, not that much robust. So we, then we have compared the robust group and non-robust, and we found the robust group have great affinity or a maximum affinity with the European ancestry mostly Greek. Then uh, we thought to date all the samples. We have gone for the AMS dating. And from AMS date, we have found that all the South Asians, they have died. They have died in seven to eight century AD. And the Greek group, they have died in 16th, 17th century AD. So on the dating, we have confirmed that both the groups, they have not traveling together. And this Rupkund, uh, this uh, uh, the, the casualty happened in two different different events, not a single event. So this is the power of ancient DNA and uh, AMS dating uh, in understanding the, uh, the the forensic anthropology. Uh, we have also analyzed uh, stable isotope, and uh, we have uh, reconstructed their diet and uh, their origin. You know, the carbon stable isotope can tell you the type of diet a person have consumed over the time. Oxygen isotope can tell you uh, in, uh, what kind of water a person have consumed since their childhood. Strontium isotope can tell you the migration history because if a person is drinking water from the Ganga plain, another person is drinking water uh, from Kaveri or from Godori from South India, so the strontium isotopic ratio from the tooth enamel will vary. And uh, this is strontium isotope and differences up to three decimal can easily tell you the origin of 
uh, person. So uh, this is the, these all are the advancement of uh, ancient DNA and stable isotope methods. Uh, as I said, uh, the radiocarbon dates you can see uh, one group is falling between seven to nine century AD. Another group is falling between seventeen to eighteen century AD. Uh, the forensic, the ancient DNA in, uh, uh, in conservation genetics, we have analyzed one uh, skin sample of uh, cheetah. You know, cheetah got extinct in India. The last cheetah was, cheetah was killed in 1946. Uh, from then, we don't have uh, cheetah in India. Uh, so th there was a big question about the cheetah ancestry. A group of people believe that Indian cheetah where we're having different kind of uh, ancestry compared to the African cheetah. Indian cheetah were short. They used to be short and they, they might be a, a subspecies of uh, African cheetah. Few believe that, that they are like, a, they could be a different species, not uh, uh, at, at the same uh, like African cheetah. So there are many speculation. And then we have analyzed one sample. We have extracted DNA. Uh, we got the samples from Geological Survey of India, uh, uh, Kolkata, and then we have sequenced the mitochondrial genome. Uh, then we found that Indian cheetah is very much polo, close to the African cheetah. And uh, if African cheetahs uh, are being brought to India, they can easily survive because their ancestry of Indian cheetah and African cheetah, uh, they have divergence, divergence time of about 70,000 years before present. We have also modeled their demography. So you can see uh, uh, once upon a time, India was full of uh, cheetah species. Uh, but over the civil, over last 500 to 600 years, they got extinct because of the, because of huge hunting by the Mughals and the Britishers. Uh, so this, uh, so here, uh, you can easily see the use of ancient DNA in deconstructing the extinct uh, species. So on the finding of, uh, on this finding, now the Indian government is planning to reintroduce African cheetah to India. Another study we have, uh, uh, we have extracted DNA from ostrich eggshell and that ostrich eggshell was 25,000 year old. Um, we, we could not retrieve enough DNA, but we have cloned from all the extract, we have cloned and then we have sequenced uh, the uh, different, different clone. And we were able to retrieve 45 base pair of ostrich DNA. And then we have confirmed that India, once upon a time, India had ostriches and they got extinct about 20,000 years ago. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, case study I'll uh, uh, talk about, and this is a uh, this study was considered as the best studies uh, in, of 2014, uh, and then it was listed in top ten uh, uh, best study in forensic anthropology. Uh, here we have found one long bone uh, by Archaeological Survey of India, and this long bone was supposed to be uh, Queen of Georgia. So the queen of Georgia was killed in 1624 AD. And uh, it was believed that her relics were brought to Goa by a few Augustinian friars. And they have buried this long bone to a, uh, to a church. The name of the church is St. Augustinian Church in Goa. So uh, we have got the sample and then uh, uh, our task was to, um, to know the ancestry because we have not found only one relic. There were many relics. There were about three to four relics from different, different locations. So as per a chronicle or a written record, uh, the, the relic of queen was buried in a Augustine church near chapter chapel. And there was the exact location of that relic. But uh, due to the demolition of uh, this church and uh, all the relics were mixed up and then our task was to confirm 
which relic is of queen of georgia and second task task was to confirm whether really there is relic of queen or it's just a, a speculation we have uh, extracted uh, mitochondrial dna and then but the extract sometime uh, the extract is full of environmental dna as i said up to 96 98% we get environmental dna that dna comes from the soil if you are doing pcr pcr will give you a lot of artifacts and uh, and the dna was so degraded you can't go for the str profiling because most of the str fragments are uh, between uh, 150 base pair to 350 base pair so up to that length you can't get the, the dna maximum dna you will get up to 100 150 base pair so you can't go for the str profiling then what we did we have uh, simply we have gone for the cloning we have cloned all the uh, all the pcr products and then we have picked each clone and then we have sequenced so from 600 to 800 uh, picked up clone sequences we have found that we have recovered up to 600 to 700 base pair of mitochondrial dna that much of uh, information was sufficient to at least understand the ancestry so uh, here i am showing you three uh, uh, three samples database uh, we have given code qkt1 qkt2 and qkt3 so qkt1 was showing different kind of ancestry or different kind of haplogroup we call a uh, uh, for all the snps or for all haplotype we give a term a broad term haplogroup one sample was uh, showing a very unique haplogroup pattern that is u1b and we have a huge database uh, from india and south asia out of 30000 database not a single individual have shown u1b haplogroup so u1b haplogroup is rare in india then we requested government of jatia to send their uh, their samples they have shipped 30 modern human samples and then we have found two exact haplotype like uh, uh, which was met, matching with the QKT1. So from this result, it was confirmed that the source of this long bone is not from India, but anywhere from Europe, most likely from Georgia. Then we uh, we thought to um, we we thought to see the um, sex of this individual, and then we did STR profiling. STR profiling. Uh, um as i said it's not very easy but one profile you can easily get that we call amylogenin profile that we call amylx so this uh, amylogenin gene has uh, two allele and uh, uh in male uh, there is a deletion of six base pair so you will get two peaks but in female there is no deletion because there's only two uh, x chromosome but uh, in Uh, male x y so y have uh, uh, x chromosome has a deletion so you can see one peak that confirms the that sam this sample was a female uh, individual so from this uh, we have concluded that relic number qkt1 is from georgia and this this relic is of female origin so it has not confirmed but it has given a great insight in understanding in solving this case and uh, this and after this uh, result indian government has returned back the relics which has gone to the georgia because queen of georgia is considered to be the considered as a, a martyr in georgia so uh, ancient dna has a huge implication and we are working on several projects uh, uh, we are trying to understand the culture our prehistoric culture and how human have lived what they have eaten uh, how agriculture have evolved uh, how we have uh, undergone several kind of domestication since when human have started keeping herds and what are the our what are the different sources of our present day ancestry so there are many questions and we are working in different different direction 
uh, at the same time we are also working on some interesting uh, forensic samples which sometime come comes to my lab so this is a short summary ancient dna is a promising tool in studying tough samples um, and i would be very happy to work with you guys if you have such kind of samples that samples you can bring to my laboratory and we can go for ngs and we can also go for because we have ancestry panels we can also go for the ancestry panels we can also analyze the mitochondrial dna sequencing so there are a lot of scope of ancient dna in forensic and this is also very sensitive method uh, because you know there are always chances of having contamination uh, while dna extraction and uh, while preparing the library so th that's why we have a different kind of laboratory setup so entire lab is positive pressured and you have to wear like body suit and uh, there are different different pressure gradients in the lab so this is a very unique lab uh, and uh, we we are following very strict guidelines to avoid any kind of contamination i'll quickly i'll give you one example i was working on a megalithic context uh, in uh, yeah samples uh, from these kind of urn urn and uh, they all the samples are from museum from a telangana museum a uh, few specimen were studied by a uh, by a german archaeologist and he has touched those specimen in 1976 and in 2014 when we started working on these samples entire ngs library entire data was matching with 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 german we were shocked like how come this this uh, this can't be possible then we have gone back to the record and we found that this gentleman he has worked in 1976 and he he died in 1999 and we have his whole genome data then uh, we approached to that professor's uh, grandson and then he was extremely happy because he has got uh, his grandfather whole genome data free of cost so the, so uh, yeah so this is a very sensitive method and uh, you know one has to be very careful in handling uh, such kind of pcs sample most of the time archaeologist and uh, as previous speaker was telling like a uh, um, uh, for sometime medical doctor they are not so careful so they uses uh, barren hand to touch the specimens so this is a uh, this can destroy the indigenous content of the dna of the specimen thank you so much